share one slide with you if I can figure out how to do it. Oops. <laughs> Let's see. While she's getting that or finding that, let me just say that I really, really enjoyed the session. This was incredible. Any session that deals with the Latino community is very, very appealing to me, and I can't wait to think about it and talk about it. Um, the, the session dealt with multiple themes that I thought were quite interesting, the ones that I saw and then I was able to note in looking at the materials that were sent to me and listening to the different presentations were themes of language, themes of culture, themes of group identity, uh, societal membership, upward and downward mobility, as well as transnationalism and cosmopolitanism. And since in the proposal it noted that I was invited because I've done some work on transnational literacy practices, I thought that I would kind of focus a lot of my comments around that topic. Um, one of the things that my colleagues and I found when we started working in the area of transnationalism, and, and to tell, I'll have to tell the truth, the project that we did this work for didn't actually get very far. So we, we spent a lot of time dealing with the notion of transnationalism, trying to figure it out. What exactly is it? And we kind of developed a, a definition that I'll read to you. Transnationals are individuals who participate in flows of people, ideas, and goods between regions, and these flows are bi-directional, they span national boundaries, and they are sustained over time. Well, that's really important because when you're doing research in the area of transnationalism, one of the issues that you face is exactly what is it. It sounds really interesting, and it is really interesting. One of the things that I noted during the presentations is that transnationalism has both positive and negative aspects. And what I like very much about the presentation is that it sort of made clear what some of those negative aspects of the term are. But when you compare the notion of transnationalism to the notions and the themes and the uh, images that our media presents to us with respect to the Latino community, it certainly seems a lot more, well, a lot fuller in terms of its potential for positive ways of thinking and for movement in terms of uh, the kinds of identities that we present to our students that are available for them to think about and, and to pick up on. That's if you open up Finder, so the little blue and smiley face on the bottom. say anything about it. I just want you to look at it, let, absorb it, let it soak in. Um, yeah, I was talking about the images that are presented to us about the Latino community within the media, and those have to do with criminal uh, behavior and with terrorism and with illegality. And the one that probably is most important for us here is the notion of lack of education and illiteracy, which comes up over and over again, especially with respect to U.S. policy towards immigrants and immigration. Many of you probably know that in the early parts of the last century, we had, there were actually laws passed to restrict uh, admission of individuals into the United States on the basis of their so-called literacy. And those literacy tests were things like, you had to sign your name. Um, they, they got rid of it really quickly because levels of literacy had risen a great deal in Europe in between the time they wanted to pass that legislation and when they actually did it. And so they had to find other uh, means for, for inclusion and exclusion. At any rate, um, I shared with you my definition. Transnationals are individuals who participate in flows of people, ideas, goods um, between regions. And I, I shared with you the idea that this is important because when you're doing research in this area, 
you've got to be able to say this is transnationalism or this is not transnationalism. We took a lot of our ideas from people like Alejandro Portas and Ruben Rumbao, uh, who argue that um, transnationalism, transnationals have to be sort of in an ongoing back and forth movement between regions and connected to that. And we wondered, does that also include uh, participation in activities like digital literacy practices that allow one to stay in contact with one's uh, region of origin or, or home as well as with um, one's adopted, adopted um, culture. At any rate, so is there potential within the term of transnationalism to promote the interests, uh, the social justice interests of the community that we're interested in? I think there are. Very, very interesting ones. And I think that the literature that we were presented just now presents lots of wonderful alternative visions that if we make available to our students or, or to our pre-service teachers our, um, and, and our in-service teachers that could actually bring about some real change uh, within the country as a whole. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from um, Pierre Bourdieu says uh, something along the lines of that the ways we think are constructs that we internalize from the societal structures that surround us. In other words, our thinking is guided by the structures that we are presented. So some of these structures can also be presented to us through the means of children's literature. Bourdieu says, um, no doubt agents do have active apprehension of the world. No doubt they do construct their vision of the world. But this construction is carried out under structural constraints. One may even explain in sociological terms which appears, what appears to be a universal property of human experience, namely the fact that the familiar world tends to be taken for granted, perceived as natural. Okay, this is the part that's important. This is because the dispositions of agents, their habitus, that is the mental structures through which they apprehend the social world, are essentially the product of the internalization of the structures of that world. As, percep as perceptive dispositions tend to be adjusted to position, agents, even the most disadvantaged ones, tend to perceive the world as natural and accept it much more readily than one might imagine, especially when you look at the situation of the dominated through the social eyes of the dominant. Okay. So that's where I think literature has an incredible potential for bringing about change. So, um, let's see. Yeah, it makes us aware of new possibilities. On the other hand, transnationalism has some negative aspects, right? And we saw those. Uh, I was just thinking and talking with some friends here at the conference, and, and we pointed out that one of the reasons immigration has been at such an all-time high in the United States over the past couple of decades is because the United States dumped incredible amounts of very, very cheap corn in Mexico and put all the farmers out of business. They had nothing to do. They couldn't earn a living. They had to go somewhere and try to find work. Um, and, and Robert Smith has this wonderful book called Mexican New York. I don't know if many of you have seen it. Great text. But he points out that transnationalism for many of the folks within the Latino community is not some placeless cosmopolitanism, but it's actually its opposite. It's local, deeply rooted transnationalism within specific places. Okay, so these small towns, these um, home bases that individuals, uh, where their families originated, they bring that with them. And that is sort of their point of departure for thinking about transnationalism. So, I want to ask the entire group that presented, this is my question for you, how well do the accounts that were presented within the literature you talked about today actually capture the reality of transnational identity, transnational life, and the challenges associated with transnationalism? And what is missing? in the text that you presented. And then specifically, I want to ask Professor Enciso, do we have really good examples of decolonizing readings that we can present to our in-service and pre-service teachers? Can we show them how to do this um, with experts who can walk them through the process? I know that we often, at least I often do, as a, as a teacher educator, I tell my students these are things that you need to do, but I know they actually have to walk through it see it, practice it, maybe fail several times before they can get to a place where they feel comfortable doing that. Second question, uh, let's see, this was for 
um, mm -hmm. Professor Medina. Given the lack of historical, geographic, political knowledge on the part of most U.S. citizens, how do we get books like those of Julia Alvarez into classrooms? And if we did get them into classrooms, how would we help teachers use them in intelligent, effective, uh, sort of forward-moving ways? Okay. For, let's see, um, Mr. Saldiva, um, let's see, my question for you is, and I love that book, very, very, very interesting text. How do we take literature like the, My Shoes and I and make it accessible to less than ideal readers? Do we have models of how to do that, of how to get, um, or how to help pre-service and in-service teachers understand how to take folks who are, I guess, less than ideal readers for all different kinds of reasons to a place where they can read the text in ways that the author meant for the ideal reader. All right? And finally, for Day of the Dead, that's why I put this image up here. How can we better demonstrate to teachers and pre-service teachers the power of literature to engage and inspire children from diverse backgrounds? What you're looking at here are two of the gods from Mesoamerica. Now, one of the things I noticed in the literature, they talk about the Aztecs. Keep in mind, the Aztecs never existed. They never referred to themselves as Aztecs. They called themselves the Mexica, all right, or the Tenochca. They were from the city of Tenochtitlan. And they were the inheritors of an incredibly rich, thousands of years old tradition of the Nahua speaking peoples, and actually all of Mesoamerica. This text was created by the, by the Mixtecs, the Mixtecos, all right? And, but it would have been very, very much recognized by the folks or the peoples of the Nahua speaking traditions, the Toltecs, people from Teotihuacan, going back again thousands and thousands of years. Aztec Empire, the Mexica Empire, only lasted a few hundred years. Um, but it was present when Europeans arrived, and that's why it probably gets so much attention and, and so much foregrounding. But what you have is Mitlan Tecutli, the god of death, as you can imagine, with the skull. And he's back to back. He's connected to the god Hecatl, or Quetzalcoatl. They're inseparable. They always go together. This is this indigenous spirituality that you talked about. You can't have one without the other. Can anybody tell me what they're doing? Dancing? They are dancing. They're dancing the world into existence. Life is the product of the dance of the gods. They're always together. They're never separated. Um, I'll leave it at that. I think the literature you presented has incredible power and potential and possibilities. Thank you so much for your papers and for the opportunity to comment on them.